What is going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome to another awesome uh, show here on Logical Plausible Probable. Today, you and I will have the opportunity to learn about some really incredible discoveries that have been made over this past decade. And uh, you were compiled into a theory called the Mesh Code. And we are going to be able to gain this knowledge directly from the man who published this new theory himself, Dr. Ben Galt. He's sharing his time with us, and it's going to be a very fun conversation. And uh, I tell you what, folks, I always like to give a little preface so that uh, anybody who has questions about, uh, you know, is what you're about to hear true, false or uh, made up? What's going on? Uh, so Dr. Gall has a pretty interesting background and he's a structural mechanobiologist. That's an awesome uh, concept there who combines structural biology, biochemistry, biophysics and mechanobiology to define how physical and mechanical forces are sensed through extracellular matrix adhesion complexes, wrap your mind around that, and how this controls cellular processes. He has developed an international reputation for his work on the protein Talon, and actually has a, his own research group uh, that has defined Talon as a major mechanosensitive signaling hub, and that it has molecular memory, which enables organisms to store data through persistent alteration of protein confirmation. Dr. Gall, thank you so much for your time. I know you're getting ready to go for a trip, so thank you for sharing your time with us and uh, educate us on your amazing discovery. No, it's great to be here. Thanks, John. Uh, and thanks for the nice introduction, too. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's well justified, and uh, like I said, I always find it interesting how folks like yourself um, will take the time out of your busy schedules to you know share your knowledge, and you know, I think very often, especially in the modern world, I find it very fascinating how there's we have so much access to information, but so few people are aware of the you know innovation and the discoveries and all these different things yeah. that folks like yourself are uh, being able to discover on a, a rapidly accelerating level. I think I don't know what your thoughts on that are, but it seems like we're just discovering new things on an almost daily basis that having a hard time keeping up with everything. Is that is that a fair subject to somebody who's in the research field? Yes, it's moving frighteningly fast. It's last five or ten years. It's just yeah, and all the new technology, all the new ideas, all the it's all coming converging to a greater knowledge definitely now for my audience you guys know that i'm very fascinated by uh, biological codes uh, the nanotech the computation that's happening on the molecular level and obviously its implications to you know biotechnologies and all the things that we're doing uh, in human innovation and trying to hybridize you know our technologies but uh, dr Gold, can you please uh, you know kind of give us an overview of you know the incredible implications and potential of your discovery and can you guys give the audience, you know, what is mesh code? What's the general concept of it? And a bit of a backstory for how you uh, realize what's going on. Because I know this has been, I think you were working on this in what, about uh, 2007, I think? Some, 2008, somewhere around there. Yeah, 2006. I've, I started working on the protein tailing, probably 2005 indirectly. So I've been working on this for a long time. Um, and we very originally, we were just very interested in how um, cells can migrate, how they can crawl around and the machinery which they use to do that. And it's via these um, adhesions which the cell makes. So we're very interested to understand how the cell knows where to grab on and how it grabs on and how it can coordinate that process. And how it grabs on is that all of our cells uh, sat on this layer, this protein meshwork called um, the extracellular matrix. And it surrounds all of our cells and our cells grab onto this and it gives them instructions on what to behave and how to know that they're in a, a kidney or a, a lung or the brain. It tells them instructions. But how this happens and how does the cell detect that and how does it hold on? And the main way it does this is by a family of proteins called integrins. And these are like hands of the cell which physically grab onto the extracellular matrix. And that's really interesting in its own right. But they're on the inside of the cell, just inside inside the cell, there's a there's these large complexes called um, adhesions, focal adhesions is the common name. And the main part of that is this protein called tailin. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's what my focus of the research has been on. And tailin links these integrins and these hands of the cell and the, the cargo net, which they're grabbing onto, it links it to the cell's um, force generation machinery. This is called a cytoskeleton. And that's a load of motor proteins which can push and pull and a load of filaments which it can grab onto. 
So it's all that's a bit of a convoluted way, but we're very interested in how tailing could make this linkage. But then what we got it as we started to learn more and more, what we started to realize was that these cells, not only are they grabbing on, but that's leading to a total reprogramming of the cell depending on what it's attached to. So there's some sort of computation at aspect. And it was trying to understand that, which just led to where we're where we are now and led to what the Meshko theory is. Um should I go on a bit longer? No, 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 no. You're, 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 that's very interesting. So, you uh, are you suggesting that one of the things that you guys kind of recognized was that we have the equivalent of like if thens happening that are somehow being accounted for, and we've got to figure out what is the you know, we're observing these things happening, and we've got to figure out what is the the kind of the cause behind it. Is that yes, possibly, yeah, and I think the best way to show that this is um, information processing, which is going on in these adhesion sites was an experiment from Dennis, Dennis Disher's lab about 15 years ago where they took some stem cells and these are a type of cell which is undifferentiated so it can differentiate into any type of other cell and it can go into like a fat cell or a brain cell or a muscle cell or a bone cell and the experiment they did was to keep everything constant apart from just change how stiff that extracellular matrix was and if they made it really really soft then those cells would read that, grab onto that and become a fat cell or a brain cell. If they made it like really solid, like glass, then they would reprogram into a bone cell. So somehow that cell was feeling its environment and then the instructions from the physical properties of that environment, how stiff it was, how hard it was to um, warp and bend, it was grabbing on and then converting that into which genes were switched on and off. So there was a clear information processing step happening at these adhesion sites, which led to the whole cell re, re, reprogramming and doing a different role. And that was what we wanted to understand, how that happened. So sidebar question. Um, does this mean, there's, there's a potential implication of what you're, we'll talk about here um, as we go throughout the interview, but is one of the potential implications of what you're researching now, could it potentially be a uh, able to, if you can figure out, what is controlling these signals you could potentially convert a cell back into a stem cell is that a potential end outcome or or modified away from what it is to something different or because i know uh, some research going on into that uh into that premise is that something that you guys even considered or is being looked at or is that a completely different context no that's kind of and a lot of people are doing that by changing the um the surface or the patterning the shapes of the surfaces which they can grab onto um, and in conjunction with some signal um, factors, like um, they can dif they can undifferentiate cells to a certain level, and there's a whole field of research in in this alteration of um, cells back from being differentiated back into being um, stem-like. So yes, I think, and in part of that is the mechanical and the geometric patterns of what they're attached to. Interesting, interesting. Well, okay, so. Um... You know, a lot of people are told that the processes that you're referring to and all these adhesions, all these different, different things are just, yeah. you know, in a biological system, that's just a chemical reaction. And they're, you know, very unaware of, you know, the word you've been using, mechanical, mechanical actions that are occurring to, you know, result in these end outcomes. Can you yeah. kind of touch on that for a, little, uh, for a second and then also explain what the concept or the term mechanosensitive signaling hub. Can you kind of give us a little overview of what yes. that means as well? So all of this came because as we we're doing more and more experiments on tailing, and as more and more things it was interacting with and jobs it was doing, we were trying to understand how they happen. And the big step change in, in the field of research I work on was we were working on two, two binding partners of tailings, so the two proteins which interact with a tailing. And we mapped where on the tailing molecule they interact. And they both bind to the same region, the same domain. But they bind to the domain in two different shapes. So it leads to this idea that there's some switches because this this domain is like a helical bundle, so it's got like it's compact and it's closed, and it binds to this protein called Riam in that state where it sits on the edge, um, maybe that way. Have you got the figure actually? The figure one of this? Um, no, figure two. It might be easier to share. In fact, I can show much. Share my. Um, oh, you share. Yeah, this. So this um, this is what the tailing molecule looks like. It's got lots and lots of these domains, and for a long time we. Um, not, not me, because it's so well conserved, but a lot of people in the field said that this was just a spacer. This was just a linker to connect the integrins and the ECM at one end, at the matrix at one end, to the cytoskeleton. But each of these domains labeled R1, R2, R3, these are 
these are these domains and these are switches and what we discovered was working on this third one this r3 and that was because it does one job when it's in this closed state and it does a completely different job when it's in this open state and that immediately showed a way that you could read physical properties of the surroundings and of the, um, the force generation because if you cause that switch to change from a closed state doing one job and one set of signals open it up to do a completely different job then if you open and close that domain using force then you can switch on and off different signaling pathways so it's not that this is just a random chemical reaction it's like these binding sites are either there or not depending on the mechanical signals and where that led to this notion of a mechanosensitive signaling hub was that here I'm just talking about this one switch, this R3 going from an open and closed. All 13 of these have the same switch-like property. So on this domain, there's 13 binary switches in a row, which I try and show conceptually on this right-hand side, because you can start to imagine that these domains can be in this folded O state or open up to this unfolded one state. So you can push and pull on these molecules different numbers of times and recruit lots of different things to do different jobs. Um, do you want to come back in? Oh, I, could go, I could talk all day, like, but no, <laughs> that's no, well, general well, so why it's a signaling hub. Because depending on the mechanical environment, depending on how stiff it is outside, and depending on how much the motors inside are switched on and off, those different parameters result in specific patterns of folded and unfolded domains which then switch on and off different signaling pathways. So the whole thing gets mechanic, it couples mechanics and physical environment with signaling pathways to give a mechanosensitive signaling hub. Hmm. That's that's very interesting. So you're, uh, you're saying that each one of these is R1, 2, 3, et cetera, is all operating as basically like, almost like logic gates to an extent to represent the zero and one on off switch and then enable path other pathways to be executed based on whichever one is open dynamically is that is that correct yes pretty much so um once we found that r3 was doing these two different jobs when it was open or closed one of the things we were really keen to do was to to understand how hard would you have to pull to make this switch mm -hmm. open and whether it would close straight away or what what would cause it to close so we went we set up a really long-standing collaboration with um in Singapore, there's a Mechanobiology Institute, and um, there we take we can take a single tailing molecule, and we can manipulate it using a magnetic um, tweezers. It's called. So we can grab a molecule, and then we can apply force and pull on it, and then we can watch these switches switch and see how they behave. How much force do you need to make these switches? And it's quite striking because it turns out that that first switch in tailing is the force generated by the motor protein. So you can pull yeah. and flick the switch and set the whole thing into action. So so in line with that, and you and I contacted about this off camera. I know you, you mentioned this in, in your paper as well. There's, uh, I know it was well over, I think you said almost close to 250 different proteins that are involved in this. Are you saying that the, obviously in your experiment, you were using the uh, magnetic tweezers you were talking about yeah. in the biological system is are there proteins that are executing that exact amount of force and able to open and close these uh, switches yes so that's the idea that the uh, as the cells moving or when the it switches motor proteins on and it's generating contractility and pulling on these these switches as they flick will change the signaling and then either turn up or down contractility so basically the whole thing works you pull on it and then you change the signaling and then it either makes it pull harder or less hard but there's this little, like these interdependent feedback loops where the pull causes a change which changes the signaling which then might make another pull or might alter the whole thing but ultimately up to 250 different proteins will come together in different or um, combinations depending on these physical parameters so basically the cells using physics in a really um, interesting way and that's what we want to understand interesting so all of this, you know, we're right now we're talking for the audience right now, we're talking about the mechanics of the physical actions that are happening in order for this. But the ramifications of all of this is that there, and this is where the mesh code really starts to come into play, is that there's actual data uh, and information being stored through these processes. Is that right? Um, yes. 
and the realization comes from the experiments where we were pulling and put um, on these switches is that they take um, you pull with a certain amount of force say it takes five picanutons of force to unfold the the realization came that if, it, if you take five picanutons you'll unfold it but if the force goes down to four picanutons it won't immediately refold it will stay stay in the open state so they've got this it's called hysteresis where the force to unfold it is much higher than the force at which it will refold so when you pull it you pull it into a state and it will stay in that state until the force goes back down quite low so they they store this information so what we start to imagine is this tailing molecule can have lots of different shapes as a function of how many times it's been pushed and pulled and um they will store that information in um for quite a long well, if you're in a perfect mechanical system, it would store that information permanently, but there's no such thing as a perfect mechanical system. Where the memory comes from is you've got this hysteresis where they stay, um, they have that short-term memory, but on top of that, you assemble this 250 different proteins which sort of fix those patterns by making big complexes. So it's the, the memory comes from the things which interact with it. But the idea is that these patterns of ones and o's uh, basically depend on the history of events which have happened to that molecule. So in that's the, that's carrying information forward in time, because depending on the shape that molecule's in, when you pull on it again, you'll get a certain pattern depending on what shape it was already in. And that's the general premise beneath the mesh code is that these are memory molecules that we're working on. And it took me 15 years to realize that these were memory molecules, but this information is system patterns of binary strings of information right okay so in line with that so for the audience um, you know neuroscientists have been you know mapping out different regions of the brain and presenting it you know all these different hypotheses over that you know a long time especially over this last 15 years right and yeah. you know all the types of actions that are being controlled by what portion of the brain but correct me if i'm wrong but you know how memory has actually been stored has been a rather elusive concept hey we know this type of memory is going here it seems like but we don't know how are you suggesting yeah. that mesh code could represent, I mean, I would use the word binary, but could represent a digital memory uh, or digital mechanism for how memory is being stored by organisms? Is that kind of a is that kind of what's being implied here? Um, yes. So again, with that stem cell reprogramming, these patterns fix, but then over time they can lead to total reprogramming of the cell. They can switch on a different genes, different epigenes, but they can capture information in the synapse. So another key thing to mention in this, I don't know if you've got my figure, I don't know, number two, what, to show where these switches are in terms uh, of um, maybe the one, um, maybe the next, was this one there? I don't know which one. Yeah, this one. So this is um, supposed to show what a synapse looks like where you have two ner nerve cells which come together and they're, um, they make a, a tight junction like this where they can send a signal from one and it will signal to the other. So these are basically um, cell signaling centers where you can send a really discrete signal between two, two nerve cells. These aren't just stuck together like this by themselves. They're held together by a, an extensive scaffolding which holds them in this shape. And that scaffolding contains a lot of extracellular matrix and a lot of integrins. And uh, tailings are an essential part of that scaffolding. So not only, so what the idea here is that this scaffolding, which holds these um, synapses together, has got these um, switches in. So we know these memory molecules exist because we can show that experimentally. And here the idea is that these memory molecules, which are, are shown to be part of the synapses, is the idea is that when the signal, the electrochemical signaling is going around the brain, it, it, it would be causing contractility in these synapses. Again, that contractility is appreciated and has been shown experimentally. But the bit we're putting here is that that, that contractility, when it pulls, would change these patterns of folded and unfolded, patterns of ones and zeros in that synapse. And in doing so, it would encode information into the scaffolding, into the shape of the scaffolding molecules. And then that would then affect the activity of that synapse so you could send information to different parts of the brain um, and the electrical chemical signaling would be updating constantly updating these um, switch patterns so instead 
one of the implications of this, I want to, I'm going to ask you this question a little later on in relation to, you know, you make the illusion or the direct analogy, uh, comparison to SSD um, storage, but are you suggesting that this is indicating dynamic read, write capabilities that are being executed here? Yes, that's definitely what I'm suggesting. That's quite um, speculative at the minute, but what we can do, we can do read, write on a molecule. We can coordinate that and we can write information and we can read that using probes to read the different shapes. So the idea would be, yes, that you could physically write information into each synapse. Because I don't know if you've got my figure six in this thing, but the, the last figure in that shows the similarities between a... Let's see. Maybe I'll share it, if not. Yeah, I get it right here. This one? Yeah, so this is what the cortex of our brain looks like. This is a really old... I love this figure. It's from 86, I think, or 96. But it's just showing three of these, um, what's called cortical columns. Um, and there's two million of these in the brain. But the thing which really leaps out in the context of, so basically what I'm saying here is that there's a physical location for information written into, into the scaffolding of the synapses. So there's a physical way to write information into matter. Um, and But what I'm showing here is this incredibly repetitive nature where these red teardrops at the top in this layer two and three, and IVA, like tier four, each one of these is a pyramidal um, neuron, and they've got up to 60,000 synapses. And each synapse has got up, to, we're estimating, we're trying to get hard numbers on it, 100 tailings, which have each have got 13 switches. So this represents, in my opinion, and what I'm trying to propose, and we'd we'd love to be able to test, is that this is a, a, a vast array of memory molecules structured in a really high ordered way. And then on the left, this is what the architecture of a SSD card looks like, where you've got this incredibly repetitive logical structure of many different channels, each one subdivided into many different NAND flash, they're called, which have got pages and blocks and then the actual ones and zeros. But it's the same, it looks like the same kind of architecture um, broadly, that you've got this repetitive thing all feeding back to a memory module, a memory controller to send information to specific sectors. That's interesting. It's really, I mean, it's absolutely, it's off, it's a bit like, it sounds a bit wacky really, but the, it's based on solid experimental data. We can, on a single molecule, we've got this. Here we've just got what we're, I'm proposing is we've got a vast array of um, these memory molecules ordered in a higher order than what we'd currently imagine. Right. Well, and let's, 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 let's Oh, good neck there. The let me see. Let me mute you for a second. Um, real quick, I'm gonna I'm getting an echo. Let me see if I can fix that. Um, so one of the points, and kind of along what we're talking about now, one of the points you make in your paper, and by the way, folks, it's the paper is linked in the description. I highly recommend you going and reading it. It's very fascinating stuff. And uh, it, one of the points you make is discovery. You know, your discovery is indicating, and you're as we're referring to now, that the brain is operating like a molecular computer, or sorry, a mechanical computer on the molecular level. And I want to quote from your paper, and then ask you to kind of expand on this as we've kind of been touching here. You say, "quote There are considerable similarities between a mechanical computer and a cell. Each cell contains a series of levers, pulleys, and gears in the form of its cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is an incredibly complex, dynamic network formed of three major classes of filaments." actin, microtubules, and intermediate filaments. There are hundreds of cytoskeleton regulators that control these networks with the precise linkages, filaments, and adapters determined by the programming that cell is running. The adhesions to the ECM mediated by the endocrine family of ECM receptors serve as information processing centers able to feel the surrounding environment and instruct the cell how to function. Now, you kind of alluded to this earlier when we were talking about the uh, different ways that uh, cells were formed, the stem cells, all those kind of things, is everything that we've been talking about now, can you get, get into the intricacies a little bit of the, you know, why you're calling it a molecular computer? You're kind of alluding to this and showing with the um, allusion to the NANDs and everything else, but uh, a lot of people don't want to really accept the premise that there's the direct equivalence of computation and a me mechanical computer executing uh, processes here. So can you kind of dive into that a little bit more detail? Um, yeah, I can try. So the general premise there is that the, the cytoskeleton, this um, network of filaments connected to motor proteins, connected to mechanical switches, provides a way um, for the whole cell to work as a computer. Because if you 
stimulate the, the side the motors at one end of the cell it pushing and pulling and trying to work it out like so the idea is that it's that's like you're switching on the computer and it calculates and it it balances out and it's the it's the balancing out of the whole system which is the computation so it's not necessarily like a computer like we'd imagine where we turn it on it works but this thing gets turned on by a signal like a growth a, a fact um, a signal comes in turns on some motors they push and pull which propagates across the whole cell and then that when it gets to the end state where it's finished because the whole thing is you don't want the engines whirring the whole time so it tries to it tries to reach a balanced state so i think this is like an energy minimization where all of this um, factors balance out and at the end you're in a certain pattern where the patterns and the shapes of the molecules are in a meaningful arrangement you know the, the point you just made about the uh energy reduction aspect we struck me when you said that was i remember reading uh some stuff a while back about how one of the things that blows people's minds about the brain capacity is the energy requirement being so low yes. and that if you the equivalent amount of computation being done by our human created computers then the energy demand would just be absolutely astronomic is what you just said about uh what you're observing could that have some relevance to the point i was just making there about the uh energy demand yeah because i think that the whole cell isn't constantly pushing and pulling the whole time it's trying to get to a state where it's it's held together like the whole thing is balanced but it's like under tension that they're like if you're in a tug of war you can either both be pulling up so it's hard as you can or you can just hold it at enough tension so that the thing is maintained but you're not using a huge amount of energy and i think it's like that i think um you want to balance this out so you're using the least amount of energy but still maintaining um the connections and the network and the linkages and that's what i think happens because just inside these synapses and what's really well established is inside the synapse there's lots and lots of these things called um, gaps and gefs, which are basically, in the simplest sense, they switch on and off the motor proteins. So when you have a signal going across, it temporarily switches on the motors, which then starts this calculation. But the default is to get back to a, a low energy state. Because, yeah, as you say, you'd burn through your glucose in high speed if you were constantly pushing and pulling or if you're constantly sending. Because some of the theories are like it's all held in almost like held in ram by these electrical chemical signaling constantly going around but that would require huge amounts of energy whereas here a low force state is actually better for preserving this mechanical state so these switches behave better if you keep them at a low force but then give temporary spikes of high force they they're much they will store the information much better so one of the things you and you and i kind of talked about before we started was the um you know, the implications of the specificity of all this versus just being random uncontrolled um reactions and such is with what you're talking about now that seems to lend a lot of credence to that point that it's not as nearly as chaotic and random as people some people like to talk about or it goes kind of previous theories of uh, how systems work oh it's just a bunch of more random reactions that ultimately end up somehow in this end outcome versus a very specified controlled execution of uh, a variety of functions that uh that is what i'm saying would you agree with that disagree or kind of somewhere in between what, what do you i would say that? that if you look at a cell with a microscope with a fluorescent microscope and just look at it in a culture in a dish it looks incredibly dynamic everything's going and all the motors are going it's sending out protrusions it's and it, everything's <laughs> turning over really fast so it looks like it's chaos um well not chaos it looks like it's order but a lot chaotic that's because that cell never reaches equilibrium because it never it's not touching its right neighbors it's not um making the right patterns on the surface getting the right signals so it's constantly trying to find it can't complete its minimization i don't know if you've ever seen um the babbage um, analytical engine these computers which are, you turn the wheel and it starts doing it yeah, if it you like, imagine what, 1837 i think something like that it was yeah so i think they've at the science museum in london they rebuilt it and they they basically with his old blueprints because i don't think he ever quite got it to work but if you imagine that you're turning the wheel and it's doing the calculation it will only reach a solution once it all comes into place so if you were to take one of those cogs out and drop it into the bottom then it would just keep going and going and going because there'd be no solution to that problem 
And that's what you're seeing when you look at cells in culture. They're constantly trying to do stuff. So they look like it. They look like there's order, but you're only getting glimpses of it. Whereas what I think is actually happening is that in the context of a, an organism, then all of that collapses into an ordered state. So everything becomes ordered. And that's really controversial at the minute, but it's an extension of where the, the concept of um, order, that's what we're looking at, order in these molecules, the shape of the molecules as a way to encode information. So I think there's a higher order of stuff than what we currently appreciate. You know, the, uh, the point you're making about what we quote unquote see, right? The, I was watching a lecture of, I mean, John Blank on the gentleman's name. He's at, uh, Stanford, I believe, but he was talking, the, the lecture he was giving was on the, uh, microtubule pathways and how some of them are one way. Some of them are two way. Some of them only go to the mem, uh, go out to the membrane. It, it was very fascinating. They were showing and one of the things, he, the points he was making was, oh, our, as our imaging technology continues to increase, we keep finding these more and more amazing different controlled functions that you're uh, in that in this context, it was microtubules that, oh, this one, and they they'd figured out how to reprogram them to this one that normally was only in this direction. They'd figured out how to make the switches and now it could be a two way or go the opposite direction, those, those kind of things. And yeah. I think, correct me if I'm wrong with this, but I think kind of what you're alluding to is as our imaging technology continues to improve, then it, the probability is we will find more and more intricately controlled <laughs> systems rather than just random chaos. Is that a fair, um, fair point? Yes, but the the imaging is needs to, like, I think we would already be able to see the order if the cells were ordered. I mean, the, the, it's actually the limitation of how we do the experiments of trying to visualize cells in a microscope. Um, so as we can get more intravital um, um, imaging and stuff, we might get more glimpses of this. The thing I could tell you that you try to lead towards this ordered system, but the cool thing is that these ordered systems come from like just is in essence three or four different proteins which interact in different ways depending on physical parameters, and then that provides a scaffold which coordinates a lot more processes on top of that. So it's a layer on top of it, but the underlying layer of where you could get all of the different, a lot of the different architectures and a lot could be quite with quite a few basic building blocks and then you can layer and layer on complexity. And I think that's one of the interesting things for me is like, could you, what would you take to actually begin to build these systems in, in vitro, in a test tube or in a Petri dish? Like what would it require? And to try and build it up from that level. Um, Here's a, a random question. Are there any, uh, and if you, you may or may not know this, are there any known uh, like mental problems that are associated with, uh, like mutations or errors in the talon proteins or any of the ones that are associated with it in terms of, you know, cognitive function? There's, there's very few mutations associated with talon in general because it's so essential because it's the core of these complexes. Um, so any bit which goes wrong, it's not, it, there is a couple which aren't published yet, which we're working through. But the proteins which interact with this and sit on top, the next layer of um, information. So I think these switches at the bottom, they're essential. If anything goes wrong with that, then it's not you're not going to be viable as an organism. And we can see that because if we put a mutation in, then you can't, um, like a fly, they wouldn't like it. So okay. they're, they're so fundamental. But the things which interact with the switches, there's loads of diseases linked to those. And there's lots of... And the things which switch on and off the motor proteins um, themselves, then they're linked to a lot of learning difficulties. And um, so, yes, the mechanical so, linkage are really important. So what you're saying is the basically if you have any errors in the talon proteins, you're, it, you're probably going to be a your body, the organism might terminate the reproduction if it's detected kind of thing. Uh, or, um, it's not gonna, or it's not going to be or it's not going to be viable. Like there'll be some stage where one of those switches or one of those things needs to be working at the right way and then it will it'll fall down because um it looks like developments a string of events once it starts every step is dependent on the previous step being almost at the right state there's a lot of um scope for tolerating imperfection but by and large one step follows the other follows the other right. and one of those steps will fall down so it um there's no, there's not really any muta mutations in tailing is the, is the short answer. Interesting. Yeah. Which have been discovered yet. Now, now it's really cheap um, to sequence people. We're probably going to find a lot more because if you present with an illness, 
or a condition, then they'll sequence you and they'll say, ah, yeah, here's a mutation in your tailing or whatever. So more and more information is coming online all the time because it, when they did the human genome, it cost billions and billions, probably a trillion pounds to sequence. But now you can get a human exome sequence for under a thousand pounds. So it's come right down, down, down. So if you've got private um, health insurance, then they'll sequence you just as part of your diagnosis, I reckon. So. Right. No, that's that's very interesting. The uh, yeah, I've, my curiosity is peaked on all of this. I'm wondering if there's going to be implications. It, it, the point you're making about the being able to do the comparative sequencing, I'm wondering if there'll be correlations between IQ and level of cognitive function and the overall efficiency of not just the talent but also the other proteins you're referring to all working together. I wonder if there's any ramifications or implications in relation to the overall efficiency of cognitive function. Is that uh, anything that's being considered? Uh, I don't know. I think mechanical computation, if like that's the idea I'm trying to develop, is like this mechanical computation which occurs. There might be different amounts of effect efficiency of that, and maybe that correlates to certain diseases. But I think it's a long way. There's a lot of complexity on top of this because what I'm talking about here is stripping this down to its absolute bare bones, and then on top of this, there's a lot of stuff. So I wouldn't feel like. No, it's not something we're considering to try. So it's, it's kind of like saying, uh, oh, this DNA sequence equals X protein and being like, that's it. <laughs> of, uh, in terms of the, the processes that are involved in just getting from A to yes. B, it'd be like saying, oh, oh yeah, there's a talent protein. Therefore, we've explained everything. <laughs> it's, which obviously is yeah, not even close memory. to being a scratch in the surface. We memory and we understand cognition. We're nowhere near. But something which is quite interesting is that a lot of the genetic linkages um, for things like Alzheimer's, they correlate with adhesion proteins, so not with tailing itself, but with the things which control tailing. So these adhesive structures, and by extension, these patterns of ones and O's, ones and zeros, okay, for you guys over there, I think O's is not. Um, this, this, this binary coding or this digital coding is, is tightly connected to the genome-wide association studies of um, Alzheimer's. So it might be that the Alzheimer's disease and some of these diseases are corrupting this information because if it was like a, an SSD card where these ones and O's contain meaningful information and these synapses have got specific things then if if that pattern gets corrupted in any way then that will no longer make sense with the rest of the interpretation of it so if like you scratch a CD then that bit you can no longer get that information back so if you're playing your favorite song and it's got a scratch on it you'll always get a bit of noise at that bit so it might be the same thing where if you start to corrupt these patterns it's no longer a meaningful thing so when it tries to rebuild that thought or that memory it might not be able to do it so that could have implications in the point of uh, yeah like with some with alzheimer's or other forms of dementia they have portions of their memory erased and now they they're viewing something from their past as having happened from their perspective it happened yesterday kind of thing because you've deleted yeah. or damaged the memory in between those stages that uh or maybe they remember a portion of an experience but not the totality and it's yes like like it's been, that, that, that one portion has been erased but they remember this you know the first segment and the last segment but they've missed the middle or you know, forget the yes. beginning you know the end that kind of thing is that we're kind of where you're and it might to? be like the different because it's not like the switch is probably just one way to capture this information but maybe in the long-term storage, these become modified so they're locked in certain patterns or the whole cell mm -hmm. might re -approach. So there might be like a really undynamic thing. So the stuff we remember from being a kid might be quite locked like long-term. Mm -hmm. And the bit which is constantly being done on the day-to-day -day might be okay. But the bit in the middle where it's more transient memories before they get fully written, if that bit is, is flaky because of this damage or because of this missigling, then that might be why they don't it doesn't all quite connect so your whole story no longer makes full sense but yeah, again it's so quite it's, speculative but the idea we'd like to try and think is maybe if it's if it is screwing up these patterns of ones and o's ones and zeros then maybe there's a way to stop that bit prior to the when you start to see these big plaques in the brain i think most of the effect has already happened long before and i think that that's being borne out by a lot of this these failed Alzheimer's drugs, which are coming online all the time now, are being abandoned because the plaques probably aren't the actual causative thing. It's probably the disruption of these this information at an earlier stage. So that would be where we'd be looking if we were going to try and 
get at this and that's one of the things we were looking at in the lab is to see could we understand the interplay between the amyloid proteins and adhesion and try and understand that interesting okay so yeah i i thought exactly what you're saying on the on the plaque i mean obviously that's the if you read the general literature for the public right on webmd and all that kind of stuff it's a oh yeah, yeah. plaque building up and is the cause of all this kind of stuff and if i'm correct if what you're saying is that may have some kind of implication at some level but we're not even addressing the root cause is that uh yeah there might be a really more much more toxic intermediate on the way to a plaque which that might be the, that might be the out that might be the end outcome, but not the root. Yeah, outcome. it might be that the brain just puts all this stuff out of the way in these lumps to try and protect itself. But the bit which is scrambling the information might be a, a extra reactive or extra species which is on is formed at some point, and that's what's causing the damage. So that's what yeah. we'd be interested to look at. But again, it's it's specula speculation, but it builds on this notion that it's if you look where um, this amyloid precursor protein is in a in a cell it, it's at the adhesion site so it leads to this notion that anyhow that's a bit down the line now i'll talk to you about that when we work that one out but now that, that that's very cool now okay so let's uh you know you and i've been going down the uh some rabbit holes i'm fascinated by all this stuff let's uh take it <laughs> back to a concept that is fundamental to what we're, we're discussing right now but i think we want to make sure the audience is kind of grasped here so you know, throughout your paper you use the term machine code um, but one of the sections that really struck me was uh, was I'm about to read, and I'd love for you to expound on this um, this point here. So furthermore, this quote, furthermore, mesh codes are found in all places where cells engage the ECM. So having a machine code running in every cell in the organism would hint at a unifying theory of cell communication, which provides an in instruction set for each cell to work in, synch in synchrony. Like computer machine code, without the necessary parsers to correctly decode the symbols, the code is unreadable to an outsider and would look like it's just pulses of electric activity triggering alterations to vast strings of ones and zeros. However, once the language of the code is understood, this information might be decipherable and reveal an unimaginable level of communication. Can you uh, kind of expand on that? And I've got some follow-up questions, but it's going to give us the general overview of what you mean by the implications of you know, what we're talking about. Yeah, so basically exactly what it says there. I think I, I, that was actually quite succinct to me to write that. I'd probably uh, say a lot longer to describe it. But basically, yeah, all of the cells in our body we, uh, are making these adhesive structures and this is holding them in the right place. But because of this, um, like with the stem cell experiment, this process called mechanotransduction, where the mechanical state of the cell is is talking to the genome and, and controlling the, um, which genes are being read and which ones are shut down, that these patterns of information on the bottom of the cell might be constantly be able to be updatable which can then lead to ordered changes in what's what genes are read what splicing occurs and all of that type of stuff um, and in which case then that means that this cell would be talking to this cell which we're talking to the, and they would it, it might be that the cells um, are sharing this information and that like the computation within each cell is like having two cells you might get 10 like they can stack up and uh, like lead to all of the cells are talking and updating each other as a function and it's like parallel processing of all of this computation and in which case if you strip it right down which i am doing I'm, this is massively oversimplified obviously but at the core this would be patterns in these switches of ones and zeros in each in each cell and then signals would come in and it could change those patterns and it might just be that if every cell is running the same mechanical coding and the same genetic coding, then there's the possibility that this could be a machine code because you could send a signal to update the mechanical coding, which would then lead to the changes. So the whole, they'd all be working together. Um, well, and, and, and the point you made um, about the, you know, the necessary parsers to correctly decode the symbols. Yeah. Um, you know, that obviously for the general audience, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, a basic concept of this is, you know, you have codons in an mRNA sequence that are being, you know, translated by the ribosomes and, you know, tRNAs or all there are multiple components all working together to read the information there. The you're suggesting that there's other types of decoders um, involved in the extracellular matrix that would be translating the signaling and then and transmitting sender and receiver uh 
aspects of it. And we basically need to figure out the, you know, the other point you made in that, that section was the implications of the language. Hey, if we can figure out what it is, then we'll understand what's going on to control it, obviously. But are you saying that we're, you know, we figured out the syntax of the genetic code. Now we're trying to figure out what the syntax is of the mesh code. Is that uh, a fair yeah, point? And we can, yeah, I think so. We kind of know what the syntax is of these mechanical switches and this mechanical computation, but it's how they connect together and how one cell's status is updating the other cell. So they all synchronize relative to each other. That's what basically what I'm trying to say, I think, in a better way, is that all the cells in our body synchronize to be part of the same organism. We're not like, just a big pile of amoebas on the floor they're all attached and they're all synchronized in this way and it's the level and in terms of like the electrical activity i think there i'm more alluding to like brain activity where you put an eeg hat on and you measure the activity and it just looks like loads and loads of electricity going round um and in nervous impulse and all of that but that would be actually be updating an underlying code underneath that and then that would be leading to the, um, the effects downstream. So that would be the idea. Um, Interesting. So, and it's the synchronization I, of all of the cells relative to each other, which is is the interesting bit. Gotcha. So, you, so you saying, okay, we've kind of figured out the syntax. Now, are you attempting to figure out the semantics? I guess would be the next kind of the next stage of this. This pattern equals X outcome. Is that uh, where things are? Would to me that seems like a a very very deep uh dark hole to be going down or trying uh, in a good way of trying to figure yeah. out what the heck all this means of because if we can understand correct me if i'm wrong on this but what it's kind of going through my mind is if we can understand the the semantic values of what's being represented by these patterns then we would be able to be you know observing the communication happening and, and knowing exactly what's happening from not just from a seeing the end outcome but also knowing what's going to happen before we see the uh before we see it, because we we don't to interpret what the signal was. Does that make sense? It does, and I think maybe down the line uh, we could understand it at a greater level. It's really, yeah, it seems a way off. It's, um, yeah, so one of the things which we do a lot of is we take the tail in and we just alter one of the switches and then look what happens to a cell, how it changes its overall properties. And it's pretty well established now by us and other groups that these switches can move different proteins around inside the cell so if we can understand the signal which makes the switch go then we can see the signals moving around and we can see like the change in the gene expression so you can start to build this up into a set the complication is that like, all of the connections and all of the different signals and all of the interdependencies because that's the main thing is all of these linkages and all these like feedback loops of all different layers like really tight ones and then big ones and then across the whole cell and then across the whole series of cells and they all different levels um, of complexity. So that would be what we'd want to try and get to the bottom of. Um, gotcha. Yeah, that, that's... <laughs> but yeah, that's... one of the main things we want to do at the minute is just with a single memory molecule, understand the rules of mechanical computation on a single molecule, because that's still quite... We've made big advances on that, and we can manipulate them, but how much information can we physically store, and what is the interdependency of those? So we're trying to make different coloured... Um, probes which recognize the different switches in the different states so we can see the colors changing on and off um, to try and infer what the shape of that molecule is because then we want to use those same things inside the cell to see what shape the switches are in um, but my i'm not looking at the organism level i want to understand the fundamental rules of this oh no I, I, absolutely obviously that's <laughs> the story. In the, i think for the audience uh, you know obviously we're, we've been talking about you know some bigger picture and implication stuff but I think for the audience to you and you've alluded you've said this many times like hey we're at the very baby steps of all of this and just starting to you know it's taken 15 years of your research to get to the point where it's like oh wow <laughs> here yeah. is the uh, the macro level implication of from a fundamental perspective it's something i'd love to talk, touch on now i kind of stayed away with this stayed away from this type of conversation so far um as we're getting into more of the you know talking about the technical side um but this is something i recognized in in the paper and i would love to sh i'm gonna share this with the audience and hopefully you can expand we've been talking talking around this so you said uh quote the appearance of tailing at the dawn of multicellular multicellularity allowed cells to store information persist persistently by writing to each talent molecule like a computer writes to a disk as well as serving as memory these switches also coordinate cell signaling and provide a way to control the reading of the genome from the periphery of the cell now the, that question where I'm going with this is 
and you mentioned this earlier about the conservation of this. Um, if everything we're talking about is true, does this imply that the function of the talon protein would be have to be accounted for very early from an evolutionary timeline perspective? Um, yes, I think it's the level of information that can be written is like these molecules, like the, the cell cell molecules and the cell matrix molecules came together about the same time to link cells to each other and to this extracellular matrix. And both of those enable the cell to, to, to write information and to talk to each other. Those two cells can then exchange information and they can synchronize to the point that you could imagine maybe this one could read something and this one could, it could pass that information on. So the development of higher order things. Um, yeah, and at the dawn of time, these were the like slime molds and things like that. They've got this machinery, they've got this mechanical computation systems, but simplified versions. And they can just, they can transition between a single cell and a multi cell. So you can just start to glimpse when this starts to occur. And what's really nice is that between slime mold and sponges, there was only a few changes to tailing, but the changes were the introduction of regulatory elements. So prior to that then they weren't as tightly regulated they could suddenly control this and then they could start to it complexity could occur from these molecules and one of the things you get i hear I got asked i think it was when i was chatting to um, someone the other week was about this protein 2500 amino acids long so it's a really long thing um but it's really repetitive because these switches they look very similar it's, um they've got very very different functions but in terms of domains it, it looks like it's just repeated repeated and then immediately they've all specialized so that's a, a, that's conjecture and speculation but what's really striking is that we've just tailing and its main binding one of its main proteins which interacts is vinculin those two proteins can assemble into like i don't know i worked it out once it was over ten thousand different combinations so the amount of information you can write into two molecule interacting in unique ways is vast so you suddenly appear these two molecules and then all of a sudden you could start to massively um, exponentially increase the amount of information which is um capturable and, and what, what was the uh, can you repeat the name of that protein you're referring to and like what's the, is that a small one a big one is it as complicated as the talon what, what's the can you give a little uh, so, that, so. so when tailing when these switches in tailing open up a lot of the switches, like nine of them, have got at least one interaction site for another protein called vinculin. And vinculin is another linkage, link protein between, it links tail into the cytoskeleton. So these linkages grow and they mature as you pull on them. So the, the, the switches of tailing coordinate the linkages. So these two guys, but because the tailing's got... Mm, I think it tells, so I don't know why, I know the number, but I don't know why I'm guessing. tailing has got 11 of these sites for vinculin. So as you pull on it, you can recruit up to 11 vinculins. They can cross link to other tailings. Tailings are diet. So you can build like big meshworks just by triggering a process. And then this, so we were even just trying to understand those two as a sort of discrete memory module, which might have um, just emerged, appeared, and to learn the information which that can encode. That's a... Uh... That's incredible. The uh, something as you've been describing this, something's really been hitting me, and I think is very often underappreciated by the average person is the importance of the three dimensional structure of proteins and how they interact. And yes. hey, this scaffold, you know, even for just scaffold proteins, right? They're oh, they're just shape, but if it doesn't have, there's you know, seventeen different proteins that all bind in a different offshoot, a little side chain of this one. You know, is that yeah. uh, is that same type of importance of the three-dimensional structure in play with what we're talking about today i'm, I'm assuming it is but I, is yes. that uh, something you guys want to do this three-dimensional shape changes as a function of the force so these molecules change their shape these domains open and close so you've got a protein which does one set of things at rest and then as you start to move it it starts to change its shape and switching on and off different it, different binding sites appear and get destroyed so you're constantly changing the signaling and that's the mechanosensitive signaling hub idea that these but one of the things which we published earlier this year which i think is hinting and it's like what you were talking about with the logic gates is that we've identified um one of the, during the cell cycle there's an um, a series of enzymes which make sure it happens at the right place and time 
And one of those enzymes called um, cyclin-dependent kinase 1, it interacts with these adhesions, but it, it phosphorylates tailin and changes the order of the switches. So the same amount of force will result in different um, patterns. So the cell can be constantly modifying the tailin scaffold and changing what string you'll generate under the same conditions. So it's, I, maybe I can share this. If you that's some that's my are you sharing your screen i'll try <laughs> i failed miserably last time but um if you're sharing something from your area i'm seeing it so this is just about to come out this is where we're trying to summarize um what the the theory is in cartoon form but um what i wanted to show was so this um this is tailing in the in the middle and then I'm trying to, this is very, un, we don't know all the ligands yet, we're trying to work this out. But this is the different domains, R1, R2. And then when they switch, these are the different signals which are turned on and off. The reason for showing this is that underneath each of these domain names, each of these, these are amino acids which are modified via different enzymes and via different signaling pathways. So it's not hard to imagine that these are switching on and off different are changing this pattern, changing which binding sites are available, and that there's a complexity to this. And this leads to this notion at the bottom, I don't know if you still see this, um, that you could imagine that a certain amount of tension, depending if those enzymes are switched on or off themselves, will generate a different output. But it can all be written into these mechanical switches and how they all respond to force crossed with um, um, like, the different in the different cellular behavior interesting so is the is what you're i'm not stopping sharing your screen i'm gonna pull up something is the, is what you just showed there is that similar to this yes so this so this paper here this is going to come out um in november this one's um so the the, the meshco theory is is the con is the culmination of all that what we work on in terms of tailing and mechanical signaling taking what this the implications of what that leads to in terms of information processing and an idea of memory this paper here is based much more on the actual experimental data what's going on and um, how these switches can flick and alter what's going on so this is supposed to be this at a glance series, I love it. It's like really uh, much more straightforward to a poster, like a, I don't know what it is, A2, to explain a difficult concept. Right. Um, it's kind of, it's, a, it's, an, it's an infographic. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it comes in the accompanying thing. But this is to try and explain this in easier terms. So I'll stop sharing now because I don't, but just to, maybe just to finish on, um, which I'll show on this, is that if you do, imagine what these structures look like but reimagine them as strings of uh, um, zeros and ones then this signaling which forms at that site when you switch on the motors and you pull on this and you change the patterns of ones and o's then that change ones and zeros sorry and um, that changes the signaling at that site it changes these um, linkages so the cell changes its whole architecture but it's all Fundamentally, it's dictated by the shape of those molecules at the core, which is why we say that these switches are, are, are both memory but also reprogramming, why they're changing the signaling. And they can then carry this information forward in time because if you were to then have that memory module like that with that pattern of zeros and ones, if you stimulate the motors again, you'll pull on that and you'll change this pattern of O's and one, zeros and ones. And then that will be dependent on what state that's already in. So you can constantly be updating um, in a very um, logical, quantized way via these switches. So that's that's the idea um, of why these adhesions themselves are the memory modules. I'll stop sharing that's that. A, no, that's that's very uh, that's very interesting. So you've got so what you're kind of saying about your paper that's coming out. You said November. It's, yeah, that, that I just showed you there was the finished proofs, so it's going to be out imminently. Okay. Gotcha. So, if I understand you correctly, the paper that we're kind of we've been discussing today was the you were explaining the concept, and this one coming out is kind of the uh, 
the proof, <laughs> experimental this proof that you, what, you, kind, you kind of allude to in, in the uh, the Mexico yeah. theory paper. And this is kind of like, okay, now here is the <laughs> what we've been doing from a experimental level to kind of back up the, the theory. Is that? Yes. Is that and it's also like um, less hypothesis, more what we actually know. And this is uh, more experimental. And it's, it's basically it's a, a follow-on, but more of an explainer to put it into more con um, what's known. Because... The idea of the memory storage in the brain, we know that it happens in the individual cells. We know it happens in the individual molecules, but there's a gap in our knowledge between that the, the, the brain could order its molecules in such a way that you could write information into the shapes of them. So that bit is what the mesh code paper we're talking about today is aimed to, to propose. Well, well, that's interesting. In line with that, uh, someone would say is the, uh, this kind of, this is close to the end of your paper, you said, um, the complex mechanical coding amounts to a machine code that's constantly running in all animals. From an initial state at birth, the life experiences and environmental conditions of the animal would be written into the code, creating a constantly updating mathematical representation of the animal's unique life. It is possible that consciousness is simply an emergent property arising from the interconnectedness of electrical signals connecting all these mesh codes, forming a complete mathematical representation of the world that gives rise to precise electrical signals that coordinate an entire biomechanical uh, biochemical organism in the context of its world the uh, you know that really struck me now, i would i would personally disagree with you on consciousness just being emergent um in the well, context of, of all this but i get the I, I totally understand the implications of what you're saying here in terms of the uh at a minimum it could be representing the experiences of that consciousness being uh stored and and rendered if you will in a in a real-time fashion is that yeah. uh is that fair i'd say that the consciousness is is incredibly speculative my wife wanted me to take that bit out because she said there's no real basis for that um but just as raising the idea but i think in terms of the, the rest of that paragraph i quite like it because you'd have you develop in the in the womb your brain would get to a sort of default state which we all get to by and large there'd be variations between person but generally the circuitry gets wired up and it happens to be the right thing and then even when you're in utero but certainly from then on when you're born depending on what you're, where you're born, what happens, um, environment you tend to be born into, this would then update these patterns of the shapes of the molecule, depending on the inputs, what you see, what you taste, what happens to you, what you learn, and connects them all to your output. So, you, so I like the idea, and I think it's right, that there's a mathematical representation of each animal's unique life. So you've got a default state, and then it optimizes itself as depending on what happens. And where the ghost in the machine is, whether that is piped in from elsewhere or it, it's emerged, I wouldn't like to guess. But right. one of the things I would say is that the notion, if this is right, which is what I'm obviously on here to tell you that I think it is and what we're trying to prove, is that we're looking at an ordering of molecules and even to the shape of each individual molecule, which is way, way more complex and more ordered than what we can currently imagine. We're sort of imagining these side skeleton forming and or whatever but here each molecule would be becoming synchronized and written update and updated with all this information and with that amount of order built into these simple building blocks then um who knows what um is that at that level of um complexity so it may be, yeah i can imagine imagine it yeah, the, the possibilities are are rather fascinating. The point you made about, hey, I don't know if it's being emergent or being piped in or whatever. E either way, it's I think we're talk what we're talking about now is the what would be necessary for consciousness. Like if consciousness is going to be in play, then you have to have it at a minimum X is something that could yeah. be being uh, determined by all of this. And yeah. I, I find it I personally find this this stuff just extraordinarily fascinating whether you want to go from a idealistic a dualist a materialist yeah. perspective and you know, all those different things it's like hey we can all you know have our differences of opinion but i think it at a minimum the the macro level implications of all this are quite extraordinary and you know one of my personal frustrations and you know, i've I've been trying to be nice, uh, not to you, in, in just in the context of the way we've been framing questions about machine code and computation, all these kind of things. But you know, I find it very fascinating how many people want to argue that there is no such thing as like actual information processing happening in a biological system. <laughs> right. I'm just like, what world are you living in? Like, this is people like yourself and other research. All these folks are you know doing this high level um, 
research and recognizing, hey, this is what we have to determine. And there's whether or not you want to argue over the origins of it or not. There's no yeah. avoiding the reality that this is what's going on. Is that is that a fair point? Um, I guess so. Yeah, but in terms of like again, this em- just going back to the one before the emergence of or not emergence as a thought experiment. If you imagine a human brain has got the machinery, this mechanical computation, then all the way like in slime molds, they've got the same machinery. Obviously, it's a much more simplified system. And in in worms, um, in mice, monkeys, all the animals, like they've all got this same machinery. And unless there's a specific point at which consciousness emerges, then maybe consciousness is in all of these type of linkages and it's just the complexity of the calculation or the computational power yeah. of how the brain gets more developed and, and the interdependency of these molecules um so that would be possibly the argument for why it's not piped in or that it's like because i think maybe all animals maybe all all all, right. all life forms are conscious um but it's it's a pure you yeah. hit well into the philosophy there but right. in terms of there has to be some way to read and write information in the brain, whether it's or in in or in life forms, because you've got to be able to learn. Like anything which involves learning, you've got to have some form of modification which takes right. that forward in time. How I think. Poss- yeah. How could you possibly learn X function if you're not storing the underlying source code yeah. that's necessary for X function to be executed? That yeah. Like, Make, makes yeah. total sense. So, so before I forget this, the uh, the point you were making a minute ago about um, changes, you know, po- after birth and such, the seems to me with what we're talking about today raises the implications of well, nurture obviously, but just the epigenetic variables that uh, are in play in a variety of fashion. I, I, I read uh, I'm trying to blank on the author's name. The book was uh, the Deeper Genome, and uh, John John I forget, I forget the guy's name. Anyway. Um, one of the whole section of the book he was talking about were some of the known either negatives or positives in relation to um, epigenetic variables derived from life experience and how it was dynamically changing um, capacity or creating all these different changes. And Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that what we're talking about today could be the underlying, uh, this is something in this manner is what's being changed. Now what the cause was, we might not figure that out yet, but this is what's being changed, which is now resulting in X outcome yes. from a so what, I, perspective. Yes, I would say to my pet hypothesis, which again is the my theory, like what I think is not necessarily, I'm saying it's right, but you'd have these switches which change the, the cytoskeleton, which would then push and pull on the nucleus to change which genes are exposed. And then the epigenetics would be a layer on that where there would be different markages. So you would write information, the, the cytoskeleton would cause alterations, and then that would be the epigenetics would be a way of like helping to stabilize those patterns. So mechanotransduction and the alteration of epigenetics as a function of mechanics is really well mapped out in single cells. The problem there again is this lack of the higher level order that it looks kind of a bit random because it depends where the cell is pushing and pulling. Whereas in an ordered system, you'd have this perfect pipeline from a mechanical and a, a, a chemical input coming together, altering this um cytoskeleton altering the nucleus and the dna and then the epigenetics would be that so this whole um, epigenetic code genomic code mechanical would they'd all be a, um part of the same o- overall uh, okay 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 that, that makes sense that makes sense the yeah one of the analogies i've thought about many times and not just not just in relation to like mesh code versus genetic code and such but other codes it seems to me like we got to figure out where the api the equivalent of the api connections are yeah. in terms of all these different systems that are um working together and they're either yeah the code the codec might be slightly different it might be different but it's be, the end outcome is it's being translated into a uniform one that's being understood by all the mechanisms in the system and mm-hmm. just to me otherwise none of this makes any sense if, there, if that's not the happening at some level then there's no way that these digitally encoded uh commands could possibly be executed there's like no in my opinion there's no logical way you could do that unless you have the and like you kind of lose in the paper you know the adapters and the decoders that are necessary to um recompile whatever the message is to result yes. in the end in the end function of course yes um, and that's where the um again my pet theory on this is the mechanical computation that the cell makes all of these motors and all of these polymerizers 
and then the interdependency of those, how they all work to balance out and to minimize over time, is an actual computer with a level of complexity and um, much greater than what we are predicting at the minute because we don't consider how ordered and how meticulous that might be. But that it might be that this always reaches a, a state and the, the cell's got a default machinery um, which exacts the program and then depending on these patterns it runs it slightly differently. And that's where you could imagine that from a single cell you could build and build and build and get complexity. The, compl the, the challenge for is how you get to a single cell, in my opinion. But the cell's got this machinery and this computational power way, way, way above what anyone would predict at the minute. And I think it's this cytoskeletal machinery, this mechanical computation. Um, so, so with this, if what we're talking about now is the implicate, the, the underlying necessities that we're talking about right now and the importance of it, does this put the... Um, relevance of the membrane formation, the structures, and all those kind of things. Does that take all that to a new level of both importance as well as complexity in terms of the interactions and everything of the cytoskeleton? Um, I guess so, but the whole thing is like uh, it's been optimized over many, many years, even if wherever it came from, it's still finely tuned against its physical environment and and optimized and every single part of that system is is heavily optimized and there's a huge like irrespective of where anything came from there's a huge selective pressure on things all the time to be as right. efficient as they can so yes i think that's why all of these things now look so well and you make a single point mutant in a iron channel or an iron um, transporter and the system will break because everything's so so optimized and every bit of it's got as different levels of interdependency that it's it's so tuned so. right right yeah no, the, the uh w one of my the systems i find very fascinating is the potassium ion channels and uh sodium ion and the the little packet like hey there's a little storage unit over here to make sure you got enough ions for x and all these yeah. different and equilibrium state balance area, all that stuff just i find extraordinarily fascinating but the uh in line with that the the voltage gate meters of those channels i find to be yes. kind of mind bending uh yes. technology if you will from a from a nano scale and the one for we and audience just for a second uh we're gonna be i'll be wrapping up here in just a few minutes in terms of the back and forth we we're having right now we'll start getting some of your questions so if you guys have questions you want me to ask uh the good doctor we got in for another maybe about 30 minutes so uh we'll see if we can get some of your questions in and um take advantage of him while he's here the uh <laughs> Uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about to kind of wrap up is the, you know, we've been using the words mechanical signaling, all these different things, right? But very often folks make the argument of stuff like, oh, and I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name. He's a philosopher of uh, Richardson, I think his name is, philosopher of biology. And he wrote, wrote this paper about how the cell is not a machine. And the, one of the arguments he makes is that, uh, Oh, because things change shape, therefore we can't call them a machine. Yeah. And the, so ultimately, the reason I'm asking this question is, and to clarify a little bit more, is to me, it seems that just because on the molecular level and the nanotech that we're observing and that humans are also creating um, can change shape and be dynamic, that doesn't, to me, that doesn't remove the premise of a mechanical function. The Would you agree with that? And if so, can you describe a little bit of, as we've been doing, but like the, the general concept of people in your arena in terms of their perception of what mecha mechanical means on a yeah. uh, molecular level. So it's a, I think that debate of whether it's a machine or not rages for a long time. My opinion is it, it's got machine like properties because um, it happens so reproducibly. And the big bit missing in all those discussions with the philosophers and stuff is that if you, and what I'm trying to bring new to this is that this level of order in the system suddenly makes it much more machine-like because you have to have this order for this machinery to work is the hypothesis. And one of the cool things about these mechanical switches is you can have lots and lots of stuff coming in and out and lots of things whizzing around the cell. But at the end of the day, that switch is either in the open or the closed state. So you basically buffer against chaos and you buffer against noise. And it means that in all of the stuff going on, then you can either be in that state or that state. So you quantize all of this chaos into discrete 
steps, which then have switch on different programs, which then have that. So there's this way of um, generating order in these chaotic, in what appears to be a chaotic system. And the shape changing and all of that, again, that's the artifact of looking at a selling culture. Basically, when you look at a selling culture, you're looking at a cell in a migratory mode because it knows it's not where it should be. So it's trying to crawl around, feel where it should be, hmm. trying to work out. Like normally, if a cell was in the wrong place, it will trigger apoptosis. It will say, oh, my goodness, this has gone terribly bad. I'm going to kill myself and, it goes, and then it will die. Um, if that's the only way you ever look at a cell, then you're going to think that this is um, not as ordered as it is. So that would be the idea. So I'd say that the, I, I don't want to get bogged down on the philosophy of arguing about um, whether it's a machine or not, but I think it's got machine like properties. And I think it's an ordered system, which has got switches, which encode information. Interesting. Does that answer yeah. the question? Maybe, no, maybe? No, 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 no. I, I totally follow where you're going. I, I appreciate that. Now the, uh, it's very interesting to me that you and other uh, people that have lectures I've watched and other uh, PhDs I've interactions with many have talked about the, the differentiation in vitro versus in vivo. And that the fact that we're just now starting to have the technology available to in on some level, be able to observe things in vivo is creating an entirely new dynamic of yeah implications and the things that you're talking about right like i, I watched a, a video it was created a couple years ago where it was like the first time they'd been able to observe a motor protein in real time mm -hmm. and they'd been able to take pictures and like create a video of yeah. it, if it walking a lot across a microtubule right obviously yes. there have been animation there's been animations you know computer animations of that for years of that process but now they'd finally been able to actually visualize it for real yes. and those kinds of implications I, well, like I said, I think this stuff is extraordinarily fascinating. I can't imagine think, the uh, the cool things you get to see on a on a daily basis. Yeah, I think that's it. Like to make a life, you need movement, and the movement is caused by things which polymerize. So you can make a filament which grows long and gets small, and you have motors which actually move. You give it energy, and it actually generates motion. And if you connect all those movements up together, then you can synchronize a whole big system, which is a cell. And then if that cell can synchronize that with its other, then they can move as a two cell and from these very simple rules of um, motors, polymerizers and switches and things to coordinate all of that. that that's life in my opinion. So. That, that's amazing. Well, Dr. Gall, I greatly appreciate your time and uh, undergoing interrogation with me. Um, so <laughs> thank you very much uh, for all that. Yeah, so you. for the audience now, I've, I know you, some of you have been sending in questions and uh, we will get to those here in just a second. But um, if you want to ask Dr. Galt any questions, make sure you tag me uh very very quickly because i'm not we're not going to keep him for too much longer because it's weekend time for him we're getting maybe six hours ahead of us and we'll make sure he's able to get off and have a good weekend get ready for his uh his trip and we want to make sure he also doesn't uh have to explain to his wife what he was off goofing off on youtube so uh, <laughs> uh all right so for actually before we get into the questions is there any uh, like final points you'd like to make uh, anything you think we haven't uh, covered or you'd like to kind of leave as a final touch with the audience um no i don't think so i think it was an interesting discussion. I think it's there's a lot to work out, and yeah, it's a great job to be in. <laughs> so, um, okay, yeah. so let's see. First question is: This extracellular matrix controlled by genes, and what role does it have or not have in embryonic development? This is from uh, Andrew Cumming, I believe. Yeah, brilliant question. So yeah, it has an essential role in in, in development. And the cells make the ECM. And I don't know if you've ever seen a dog making its bed where it pushes and pulls and tugs on it. Oh, yeah. And they do that. So if you look at a cell on some ECM, it pushes and pulls. And, and then there's things called fibroblasts, which go it through the matrix and push and pull. And they, they balance it out. So, yeah, the, the, they make the, basically how I picture that is they're writing information. They're getting that matrix into a specific pattern of information, which the cell can then interpret. Um, and it's absolutely essential. Yeah, anything which screws up um, matrix formation or any of the integrins which grab onto it, then they have massive um, embryonic. If the nearly all of them are, are lethal, so embryonic lethal. So. Interesting. So there's definitely a, <laughs> this stuff better be working, or we might have a problem. And even in and the, the yeah, and the matrix. There's, there's a whole institutes working just on this matrix. It's like it looks like a cargo net. 
but there's lots and lots of proteins and lots and lots of signals in it. And you're probably familiar with collagen because um, yeah. that's the, one of the main matrix proteins, but there's things like fibronectin and they all make this different meshwork with different patterns. So I think it's, it's patterns. It makes different patterns in that. And the cell, you could imagine that the cell could, could alter that to alter its coding inside. So yes, I think it's really, really important. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So up next, we've got a uh, Utopia Buster says, is there any relationship with Penrose's Orch OR theory? <laughs> um, no. Well, no. So the good thing about the, the Meshko theory, in my opinion, is that it's based on biochemical and biophysical rules of how a protein will behave in response to mechanical force. So all of the bits of it are based in in the reality and it can be coordinated via simple rules of turning motors on and off um, which exist and has been shown to exist the complication with the um the arch and the quantum in the microtubules is how do you have wet quantum where and how do you write that the microtubules are changing they're doing the state um and where do you how much information could you encode in that is that a single binary thing here we've got many many switches so the different patterns and combinations of those switches it, so no I, I don't think so it's the short answer i've heard them banded together but like mesh code and or, um mic, quantum microtubules but i don't think so and i think the yeah. good thing here is that we'll be able to we should be able to prove this but i can't imagine a route to prove um the quantum stuff not to say that yeah that might be a limit in my imagination but <laughs> no it, it makes sense i, I think uh, correct me if i'm wrong on this isn't it the Aren't they saying it's like just the was it the asynchronous microtubules that we do in the quantum function? Uh, I think it was, I, I forget. If there's some delineation of uh, like only this type of microtubule could potentially be doing the, the computation. But uh, but I agree with you. It's, it's definitely something that's difficult to um, to analyze for sure. Yes. And, so uh, there was a really um, interesting comment from um, quick a few years ago and he was saying about it would be hard to imagine memory molecules because molecules don't last for many many years like they don't last for the duration of how long you need information but the cool thing about the mesh code theory is that these are adhesions they're complex where there's hundreds of molecules which are stabilizing those patterns and reinforcing them via like these positive feedback loops so these patterns will be able to tolerate if one protein was to come away or one switch was to go into the wrong shape it could be it would refit because it would it wouldn't be consistent with the whole thing so yeah i think that that's why i'd be um i think these are provide a meaningful way to encode information interesting um okay so <laughs> this is super chat from doki doki uh and ben this is a uh, this is an inside joke he says would you describe dna like a glass of diet coke thank you the <laughs> The reference to this is there's a gentleman who I actually I debated uh, last year who argues that the code in DNA is no different than the differences between D uh, Diet Coke and regular Coke chemically, and uh, it's turned into an ongoing. Right. <laughs> it's it's turned into an ongoing joke of like, what are you talking about, man? Like, don't be comparing <laughs> the uh, complexities and the importance of DNA with you know, oh, it's just like Diet Coke, you know um all right jamie I russell i don't know about that one but yeah well everything's like diet and coke from a certain perspective i suppose like it's right, well, basically well to put it in context this particular individual was uh adamantly arguing that there is no such thing as code in dna and like it doesn't exist is the implication but anyway um jamie russell thank you for your super chat he says uh that was about consciousness it is emergent by design. Could you speculate about the implications on future tech, i.e. AI, medical advancements, etc.? <laughs> yeah, so short answer, don't know. But in, like, if this brain is this massive, complex computational device, as everyone seems to agree it is, then if it connects all of the inputs, everything you smell, everything you touch, everything you do, and all your other thoughts with what you've done in the past, and links it to outputs then maybe that whirring is this computation if 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 brains do wire up with a very um, uniform wiring structure wiring pattern which is written into the coding of the cells then maybe you could imagine that it'd be possible to extract information from it in terms of consciousness no i don't know 
um because we don't know where it is or what it is and it's hard to find even correlates of where it is but if it is just the the processing bit of the input output machine machinery which is yeah, I don't know. That doesn't really answer the question, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I, well, I think one of the other uh, points he was probably asking about too was, and I, I, for, I think you actually alluded this, alluded to this in your paper, and uh, in, in relation to, like medical stuff. Um, there's a lot of implications in this in relation to like cancers, right? If of cancer treatment or causes. Um. Yeah, because I think in terms of like this mechanical signaling goes wrong in. In cancer a lot because one of the things which can make a cancer particularly aggressive is if it starts to deposit a lot and a lot of matrix it gets really really stiff then the cells detect that and they think this is a time to grow and a time to start crawling the signals get corrupted and it becomes migratory and that's downturn so this balance between what it wants to be like it's kept in check by its physical parameters if they get changed then yeah, in cancer, that's really bad. So if you get fibrosis of your tumor, then like in things like pancreatic cancer, that can be particularly nasty because the cells become so migratory on it. Hmm. They get the and, wrong set. And pancreatic cancer has like an extremely high death rate, doesn't it? Like, I mean, the, it's just, the survival yeah. rate's basically nil almost, isn't it? It's, you don't want to get that if you can help it, yeah, because it's really, really, it's brutally aggressive and their cells are so they get re reprogrammed and then they go off and they spread so effectively and it just, it's it's a horrible. So we're actually trying to work on that to try and work out. It's definitely to do with the stiffness of the of the tumor. If you make it suddenly, so it thinks it's on a really soft substrate, it can be just as bad. It's like you want the, sub, the stiffness to be normalized so it's a nice, to, to keep them in check. And then once they're kept in check, then you can treat them with more classical cancer drugs. So that's what we're trying to see is there a, is there a way to do sort of combinations to limit the to to stop them getting so reprogrammed and then also then to treat them? So yeah, that's gotcha. the way so you're, so you're you're trying to figure out the ways to plateau the reproduction and the metastasis and then be yeah, able just, to annihilate them theoretically annihilate them with more traditional treatments. Make, yeah, um, I would keep them where they're in a nice bit where you can c remove it before they start going walk about so, okay, yeah. like oh or even just like straight up cut it out gotcha gotcha that makes sense but by the time yeah, they spread you're done for because they they go off and then they make their own niche elsewhere and start to grow uncontrollably there because they reprogram as a function of this gotcha gotcha uh all right god is now here thank you so much for your uh, very generous super chat he says looks like one evo atheist visited the live stream to give a thumbs down to science that is one dependable testable prediction <laughs> I, I got a good chuckle out of that one. Did I get um, a thumbs down? Oh dear. Well, you got one, it looks like. The, oh. Well, there, there's a few folks. You got 21 uh, thumbs up and one thumbs down. That, that number's going to go up, trust me. The, uh, oh. it's, it's early. Most of, Usually I do streams much later in the day, so um, there'll be a lot of people that come back and watch this later. And okay. Trust okay. me, they will uh, They will appreciate the our conversation. The, there's actually there's four or five guys that I know right now that they stayed up way too late last night doing some research on another topic. And... Uh, <laughs> I know they'll watch this later because I got a message this morning of, oh, yeah, your interview's at 10, isn't it? 10, 10, 10 a.m. our time. I'm like, yep, where are you at? <laughs> I'm going back to bed. I'll watch it later. Um, okay, so let's see. One of the things which is cool uh, in the paper, we didn't touch on it today, was that it suggests a theory for why you need to sleep and why those guys won't be functioning too well today by doing their all-nighter, is that this notion that maybe if this is physical data storage in the brain, that maybe the reason for sleep is that you physically write the information into your cortex and update it. And um, that the REM sleep with the electrical activity might be the motors being switched on and on to update these patterns so that the, the flow of um, around the brain is updated with this information. So that was another, yeah. <clears throat> That's interesting. I, a couple of years ago, I read a, uh, a study on the cognitive function like optimal state in relation to sleep and i forget yeah. the exact numbers but it was like uh less than i think five hours and more than like nine you had equivalent pretty close um deprecation in uh cognitive function like executive yeah. functions all that kind of stuff and then it was like seven hours and something i forget the exact numbers was like the optimal range mm -hmm. what one of the things i found very fascinating though was the 
less than five, you had the equivalent, not just in your brain, but like just overall motor response and everything was the equivalent. I forget the exact number. It was like, it was like having a blood alcohol level of like 0.0, whatever it was. You basically yes. were, it was, you had the same capacity as if you were drunk, basically, yeah. uh, with the sleep deprecation and, or you were in some kind of same too much as well. Yeah. Cause a lot of it, like when you have your day to day stuff, it all goes into your hippocampus. It's computated and thought about and processed. But then it has to be, that's like, a, a, you could imagine it's sort of like RAM and then it gets written into longer term storage. And it also gets consolidated with all your existing memory. So there's this notion I uh, propose in the thing that the reason when you first get to sleep, you're going to really deep sleep and that enables everything to finish from the day and like all the calculations and all of the input and everything to reach a sort of steady state. And then you have this high e energy um REM sleep where there's a lot of electrical activity and that's where that information is then written and processed and written into your brain and then you go back to sleep really you go into a deep sleep again to let that finish off and then you have multiple cycles of that and it's basically like um, database management is what I try and put it possibly because you've got to rebuild that data to make it consistent with what you already know because that's one of the amazing things about how we function is how we make things consistent with our own world and our own understanding of the world. So it's almost like we've got a, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're cleaning your cache, if you will, uh, then to keep storing all the important stuff, deleting stuff that's not, and uh, yeah. making sure everything is uh, put into the appropriate uh, pathways and addresses and such in this context in relation to like the, the flash memory. But um, yeah. the do you think that this, the, what we're talking about right this second has implications in relation to from an educational perspective of why getting a good night's sleep especially is like little for kids right of because they gotta get up in the morning go to school and all those kind of things that if they're not being able to get enough rest and that deep sleep rim balance uh that they it might it, this is a hypothetical here but do you think that might impl uh, impact how well they learn something or how fast they're able to learn a concept yeah i think so because you're not if stuff your rams full at the start of the day it's not fully cleared and you're not fully consolidated what you've already got so you you're already running with it like if you start from a fresh start and you can start to build all that stuff it basically it, it almost like not quite the same but like almost gets like fragmented because you've got the information from that day which you've not built in so it's after a while that becomes hard to to read and to perform with and you notice it. I mean, when you do an all night or you go out for a heavy night, then you, you're not as cognitive the next day. You're not as useful in terms of. <laughs> no, I totally, totally understand. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a, a problem, which I think and I would, I would wager that, especially when you were working on your PhD, you probably uh, re experienced a little bit of sleep deprecation <laughs> on occasion <laughs> with all your research. Uh, okay. Tony says, uh, what's his opinion on the chirality problem and selecting the 20 correct amino acids for life through purely uh, or in uh, prebiotic environments? This is a kind of a, I've seen a biogenesis question. I don't know yes. what your thoughts are on that. So I don't have a strong thought on it either way. There's obviously, how, however you think about where everything came from, there's a huge gap in terms of the understanding of where these things assembled and how you got to it. And my, from a cell onwards, I can imagine how things could work. It's how you get to that cell with all of its working parts and interdependencies where I struggle. So I've got no strong feeling. If I had to say what my preference would be, it'd be almost like, as I was saying in the other day, I can't, I can talk it to a tangelo, where if you, um, if we, we can fly to Mars now, if we were to seed that with some cells and wait 10 million years, then there might be all sorts of different life structures there. Like, cause it's how you get to that cell in the first place. And maybe right. a cell was developed, some, a cell emerged somewhere else and came to this because the bit I struggle with is, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying there's a bit missing in the understanding of how I can picture it, is that lightning hitting a sulfurous pond, how do you capture and how do you improve on it? It's not like that. that's wrong. It's like there's a big gap between that to that. And so where there's nothing to fill that gap, everyone fills it with their own working hypothesis. Right. I don't know, but I think from a cell onwards, I could imagine, and I could imagine evolution from a cell. Gotcha. That's going to answer the question. I'm shaking it because I've got no idea, and I've not got a strong opinion either way. Well, you, no, no, actually, I uh, I appreciate the fact that you 
is that you don't have an opinion either way and having a hard time, you know, figuring out a, a viable, you know, position on it. Because I think a lot of folks take a much more aggressive position. Oh, we've totally solved this. And I'm like, there's a ridiculous amount of steps we have not accounted for in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, yeah. That uh, seems to be a very uh, major yeah. leap. Um, so Dr. James Carter just joined us. He's a uh, also a PhD biochemist. Um, he just popped this up here. Um, says, does Dr. Galt think that the effects of ethanol on the brain might have to do with the interface of hydrogen bonding and tailing inter talent interactions? <laughs> Yeah, I thought this crossed my mind because one of the things we first thought to do when we were doing the single molecule pushing and pulling on it was to try and do that and add some ethanol in. And we might still do that experiment, actually. But then I got more moving towards that maybe it's affecting the, the quality of the signaling and actually disrupting the receptors on the outside. But yeah, ethanol clearly makes it less work less well or better well in some respects, depending on how you feel. But it's a good question and I don't know the answer for sure, but it would interfere with the interference with the hydrogen bonding for sure yeah interesting um imagine you two, two but of why you have, have a good combo about this <laughs> why be specific to not screen up everything I, maybe just in the bits which are currently doing a lot of the activity and a lot of the changing maybe the ethanol tilts that slightly makes it less um effective but the stuff which is changing more slowly maybe that's not expected bad so yeah it's actually a good shout so interesting um now this is a interesting question from andrew um i think in your conversation with Tangela, you guys had talked about how there weren't really any precursors to talent but he says uh, you mentioned how the talent protein is made of many repeated domains slash segments is yeah. it possible that duplication and divergence could explain this um yeah so the interesting thing with the the switches the most of the switches have got this unique fold which is only in tailing so this fold, like it's a four helix bundle with an extra helix which comes on the side. And that extra helix is really nice because it makes it so that the, the ends of the molecule, the ends of the domain, I can't get my hands right. It's really weird with the mirror, um, uh, uh, either end. So you've got your domain and then on either end, you've got the end. A four helix, both ends are on the same end. So the addition of that fifth helix really changes the properties. So, but then every single one of those domains has got the same structure with a couple of exceptions. Um, then the, the main exception being the very, very last domain, which is acting binding, but that's in all animals, that's in yeast, um, that's in, that's a, that's a very common fold. But then there's the, the, the 12 switches after that, or the 10 of those switches have got this unique fold. So maybe it appeared and then it duplicated fast if it was to be but then once they've got the same fold, but they've all got different jobs. So they switch, they bind, they interact with different stuff. So even though it's got the same fold. So yes, it could definitely have come from duplication. Um, it seems, but the interesting like thing is that it's every single tailing in every single um, animal cell from molds upwards. They've all got the same 13 switches The number, and they're all in the same order. You can tell from looking at a slime mold, which switch is which. So, this pattern has been perpetuated all the way through all animals. Okay, so if so... it is a data string, a data molecule, then the, the order of the switches would be presumably important. And that order has been highly um, contained. And it's never changed. It's, it's never had 10 switches and then another 15. It's always been the same 13, exactly the same, which is okay, quite unique so, in terms of so, molecules so... in terms of how aggressive the, the conservation has been. Right. So it seems to be kind of what you're saying is, yes, theoretically, I guess it could have come from duplication. However, that would have had to have occurred prior to slime mold, as an example, uh, being in place, because everything from that level up has the 13 switches. There's not a this one has seven. This one has nine. This one has 11. This one has, they all have 13. So either yeah. you have to say that it evolved uh, prior to all of this happening and then it just stopped at 13 or it was 13 from the beginning. Is that kind of the. Well, what, what, yeah, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying it's 100%. Slime I'm just saying like that's a free slime mold. There's no records. So you could make up anything in that. What happened? Here be dragons, I think is what my PhD supervisor made when I had a two point graph. Um, it's like, who knows? But I mean, it'd be easy to imagine that you could build this up. So you could, you could say it just appeared, or you could say this domain, there's a lot of duplication because there's loads and loads of helices in the cell. And maybe they just, there was a, I don't know. Um, 
so you could argue that both ways and i wouldn't want to be right. drawn on which way but the fact is of all the records which we've got access to maybe we'll dig a deep hole in the arctic in the antarctic at some point and find stuff and say oh it's only got six but um in all the stuff where we've got access to it, it's DNA, so we can tell what sequence the tailing is. It's always got the same thirteen. Gotcha. Now that, that makes uh, makes a lot of sense. It's kind of a yes. I can imagine, as you said, here to be dragons, but it would be a, a an assumption or an assertion, not something that's empirically proven. From uh, yeah, and it'd be quite the, 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 data, the data you currently have access to, anyway. Made it like made a protein like that, or maybe yeah, I don't know. It's like. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. Uh, okay, so Utopia Buster says, would you consider consciousness a fundamental aspect of universe nature? Can memories as information actually be lost? So the first question, one possible thing, and I'm not a big advocate of it, but is this notion of panpsychism type thing where right. um, everything has got matter, um, consciousness at some level, uh, but the ordering of this, and maybe because every single I'm proposing every single well every single molecule in a head is either in a specific confirmation or is moving between two different positions so they're all ordered in a really high way in which case then maybe that leads to a higher concentration of this but i don't know if that's actually true but you could imagine it and um, in terms of memories being lost absolutely because if you scramble these patterns so they no longer make sense then that information would be gone. The same with the scratching the CD. The CD, it, you've lost that information because the ones and O's don't exist anymore. So when you're playing your favorite track, you hit that bit and the words are gone because it's no longer there to make sense. And you can't retrieve that very well unless you get another copy of it. But So I think, yeah, memories can be lost and they can be overwritten as well. Hmm. And I would also say that forgetting is a really important part of memory because one of the things that you're doing all the time is constantly updating it and building it up with the new information and the new connections you've made so it makes sense um okay andrew kaufman great member thank you so much andrew for your support of the channel as well you say I should get cut of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh what does dr galt think about head cheese or smart cells can they be programmed eventually using an understanding of mesh code um I don't know. I've never come across those two terms. So one of the things which we're trying to make at the minute is is actually build material out of tailing using these switches to actually build a meshwork like a, a gel. So would that be a smart gel? But then you need the, the beauty of the system is that the motors switch on and they pull a finite amount of time to flick a switch. And then um, so in, in principle, yes, but I would imagine you could easily make a gel which has got these switches in to report on a, a single thing, like has it been stretched, yes or no. But whether you'd write what level of information you could write into an unrestrained gel would be, might be quite limited. But that would be one aspect I could imagine. Right. Well, it, I think there. my personal opinion is we're just barely scratching the surface of what's possible with the programming that can, is available or the the potential for program that's available in synthetic biology. I mean, mm -hmm. let's be honest. We yeah. barely had the, uh, up until CRISPR, what we were being able to do was extraordinarily limited and yeah, <laughs> best like maybe we'll be able to pull off, when have an idea of what we wanted to accomplish, but actually being able to execute it on a digital level was not all that feasible. Yeah. And of course, as, uh, as you know full well, I mean, the, the programming technologies that are available for uh, DNA synthesis and everything else is nuts on yes. what's, uh, what being researched I've, i don't know if you follow this stuff but the uh some of the guys over at cambridge they've written a, a, a custom language specifically for dna programming and okay. they, there's another group in india and i think mit's also done one like the one of the groups of rich one now they like they took the verilog code that we usually use for uh chips and created a new version of it specifically to basically you can write in in verilog code and then it uh, turns into a DNA sequence and then you can send that off to be synthesized for a custom yeah. function. And I know there's different variations for those kinds of capacities, yeah. but that's just kind of, when you think about that kind of uh, opportunity, it's kind of mind blowing of the, the potential opportunities as well as the ramifications of what's yeah. doable. And I, I would assume that same premise, I mean, good grief, we could figure out how to program a mesh code. That's a, 
Yeah, I would I would wager that's probably a whole nother level beyond even what we're doing with CRISPR at this point. But um, yeah, but if you look at the difference between uh, a gorilla and us in terms of the DNA, there's a relatively few number of changes which have led to a several orders of magnitude difference in the computational powers of these systems. It probably because of the circuitry of the brain, to be honest. But then, but still, just ex a more. Um, yeah, more complexity, more circuitry, more um, higher order of that. So it's hard to imagine that it's hard to imagine that you couldn't have a similar set of changes, which would lead to something which would make us look as simple as my dog, say thing, in terms of in the level of intelligence, because it, it, that's what you see going back through evolutionary time. Like as as they get more complex, the changes are quite small. Somehow, the change in the coding of the individual cells gives rise to an organism which has got a vastly more complex, like orders and orders of magnitude more um, capabilities. Now when, now, when you say the differences, are you referring to like the pro, like the gene sequences, or are you talking about the regulatory factors as well? And the reason I ask that question is the uh, some of the things I've been reading recently are the the discoveries that oh wow we thought you know there was these amazing similarities in the coding regions. Yeah, um, but then we're finding out that the regulatory uh, aspects are dramatically different um, yeah. between organisms. W w do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think that calling it junk DNA is like peak human arrogance because we don't know what it is. Therefore, it's junk is like the hubris of which we can have as a um, as a race, as a species is quite vast. But in principle, like the the genes themselves, in in terms of coding, they might just be the objects or the things you can call in certain orders in response to certain signals and it would make much more sense that the actual the coding is the the other bit like the regulatory factors or the localization factors so that you pull different bits to the to the edge of the nucleus in response to different signals so um i think that that, that junk is where the coding exists is the short answer to that i'd say but i've got no evidence for that but that would make that you don't have any uh over on your side of the pond uh, you don't happen to know uh who dr nessa carey is by chance do you no i think, she, I think she's a I, I think she's at university of edinburgh perhaps but anyway uh she wrote a book called junk dna and oh yeah i know that book it, i haven't read it but is it good the uh it was very interesting she kind of makes that point throughout the entire book of just like <laughs> okay we are doing nothing but discovering new and new uh functions we're just like I forget the exact number. One of the points she was making is that it was a huge percentage of the new diseases that are being discovered are the result of mutations in regulatory regions rather than coding regions yes. or like gene sequence regions. And I thought that was rather interesting. And then uh, something else I came across recently, this goes back to the uh, cognitive aspect. The, uh, this is a relative recent paper. I think it was 2017, maybe. Um, anyway, they had come across one of the points of the study they'd found was that the, there was like a 30% variation in uh, expression levels of different aspects in like chimp versus human brains. So like, oh, it was all these very similar sequences and proteins, all these different things. And they're flying, oh, wow, <laughs> this one is way more expressed. And this one's downregulated and all these different things. And it was the regulatory variations that they yeah. were finding that were dramatically yeah. different I, versus the oh we're only two percent three depending on who you argue with you know it's 12 to somewhere between two to 12 percent variation in chimp and human D, uh, dna and they're like wait there's 30 percent in this portion of it from a regulatory perspective specific yeah. this was specifically in relation to cognitive function yeah a bit contentious but i have a bit of a bit like not an aversion to all of this where going in blind and just dissecting them enough brains will work this out like because the actual core bit the bit they can't you won't see and there's so many like we're we're working this out at the fundamental level and at the cell level but then hoping we can scale it and then we can look in an animal and we know what we're looking for like all of these people are looking basically looking for associations between some variables and saying oh yeah, this has changed or and i think there's a lot of I'm going to, I should stop it because I'm going to get contentious, but there's a lot of blind spots in neuroscience. Like there's a lot of blind spots in a lot of fields where it's assumed that this is known, whereas the actual evidence or the linkages to show that this causes this is a relatively small amount of evidence, which has then been extrapolated really, really far, which is what I'm doing here. Apart from we're trying to work at the individual molecule level and then the cell level and then a, a, a group of cells, a sheet of cells, and then 
then in an animal, and then getting the human diseases and coming backwards and trying to build it up across the different levels of explanation. Because if you just do an MRI or you just do a lobotomy or a scalping of a monkey, you, what you learn, it, yeah, so... You're not getting in the, uh, as we were talking about earlier, you're looking at uh, in vivo versus in vitro and then expecting to, oh, this must be what's happening versus, hey, you're looking at a broken system right now. <laughs> Why would you expect the... Uh... And we don't know what we're looking for, but there's an association here. This is this protein's changed 30%. Therefore, this protein must be doing this. And there's this sort of leap in, like, this means this. Whereas the bit in the middle is the heavy dragons again. Like, it doesn't necessarily, it might be that this is... A result of something else which is also so i think it's anyhow i'm just we don't my wife's a vegan so we try not to do i don't do any animal stuff really but we oh, can work a lot of it out. we can work a lot of it out by just understanding what's going on and the rules of the game and what the actual how the building blocks and how the machinery works and that's our focus well that's that's one of the benefits of uh at a minimum the human level of consciousness right we have the ability to imagine and to extrapolate things based on i mean yeah what is for, what is forensic science right like forensics necessitates that yeah. uh, aspect of consciousness and to be able to imagine what must have happened and then be able to test the imagination to find out yeah. if you're true or false in the Agreed. in the end conclusion uh real quick it has so to be consistent across all the layers of explanation any idea there's not going to just simply be this this thing here where this electrical signal is is what's happening there's got to be something which happened and it's got to cause a uh, a meaningful bio biochemical change. It's got to be some way of writing this and changing this system. So, anyway, makes sense. Um, well, we're uh, getting close to our uh, our stopping point. So, one actually, let's see. I don't mind saying another ten minutes if it's stuff. So. Okay. Um, this is Andrew was talking. He says, Doctor Thomas Demars, University of Florida, rat neurons grown and taught to pilot a flight simulator. Uh, people have called the grown neurons head cheese. Okay, that's what he was talking about earlier on the. Right. That's, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Amazing what you can do with rat brains, apparently. Um, appreciate that, Andrew. Uh, and then other Andrew says, uh, might wrap up this one. One last question for Dr. Galt. Does he have any general thoughts in the field of evolutionary developmental biology? Only pretty much what I've said that I can totally imagine. I don't think it, I don't imagine from a cell building up the complexity with the increasing computational power of um, parallel processing between different cells with the east and um, the matrix and um, so you could imagine that they could you could build complexity from that state but up to there no i don't have a no <laughs> is the short answer i don't yeah. know what happens to get to the cell yeah uh, yeah jeremy england wrote an interesting uh his, well, he's written papers and his uh, one of his books on on the abiogenesis problem. And one of the things he discusses is the like the barrier just between like prokaryotes and eukaryotes from a thermodynamic perspective was like two hundred thousand times greater. I think was the, yes. the general number he put on it. And obviously, there's a whole another gigantic barrier between you know random chemicals and a even a simple cell. And, but maybe I should clarify that because in terms of by saying that, what I mean is in terms of the hypothesis for how that comes with the lightning hitting the ponds, there's not a, su a sufficient way, but there's not to say that there's um, ways where this complexity could emerge because one possibility is that with these four proteins, like tailing, vinculin, actin, and maybe just with those three, you can already start to assemble vast arrays of complex um, confirmation um, information into the shapes of those. So it could be that you just need to generate a few building blocks and it might exponentially increase in complexity. And it might be that you can build really fast, but at the minute there's not I've not seen anything to like how you'd get to that even to that stage or how you'd and a lot of the steps to have change over time, a lot of the steps might you might have local energy minimums where it's actually detrimental on the way to being better. So there's a there's huge gaps. And that's not to say that I think they're, they're impossible or that there must be a creative step. There's just big bits of the puzzle which are missing completely from any discussion of this. So anything to fill that gap has to be faith-based because you've either got to assume that it can come from absolutely nothing or you've got to assume it can come from some sort of creative. But that bit, we don't know. And anyone, if you think you know that, then or you, like 
it's faith. It's just faith. Yeah, the the point you're kind of alluding to there on the the gaps in the knowledge, the you know, a lot of times people want to say, Oh, well, we'll figure it out. And I'm like, it, from from my perspective, especially the more we're learning from the technological perspective you know, aspects and things we're discussing today, and like you made the point, hey, oh yeah, if I have talent, if I have these other things that can we know can do information processing, then um you could see it. And I, I agree with you. Like when I look at the what we're discovering with cells and mechanical compute computation, all these different things like, okay, to me, it, there's a lot of aspects of, you know, what we're trying to recreate in artificial intelligence systems that we're seeing operate happening in, in biological systems, right? We're seeing very similar types of things, except better than what humans have created so far. And yeah. I'm like, okay, well, if that is the case, then theoretically I could see how things could improve and get better over time, all this kind of stuff. But that's assuming you have the initial AI system. Right, that's able to be uh, accomplishing all these functions, and then I'm like, okay, what is the necessities for those to exist? And you start, as, to me, anyway, as you go, keep going down further down the to the root necessities. To me, I'm just uh, from my own my, my own self. It's not that I don't think that we can potentially figure out a way to do it as humans. To me, just the premise that it can happen without the underlying necessity of the intelligent agency, to me, seems to be here to be dragons, so to speak, yeah. uh, for, for me, even if you want to argue that, hey, after this is done, then uh, more advanced things could develop. Okay, that's 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 fine. Although I think from a probabilities perspective, you get into some crazy uh, yeah. unlikelihoods of, you know, just what are the probabilistic resources of the universe? Even, even if you account for a 13.8 billion year old universe, is there enough probability resources to account for like the functional bits? And that's yeah, you can, you talked about this earlier in uh, context of like the the talons, what twenty five in the ballpark of twenty five hundred amino acids, right? Mm -hmm. You think about that from a number of functional bits that are necessary for that to exist, then you have just you're so far beyond the total random search probabilistic resources of the universe. Yeah, and the problem, those, I, those are the kind of things to me when you really contemplate. It's like, huh, <laughs> this yeah. is some uh, kind of mind bending stuff to think about, you know. I could totally think that from a cell, like um, we could plant cells, they could grow into different stuff. Like someone could have put a cell down and then just watch what happens. And in the context of the whole universe and the, the, how many billions of years, the fact that we don't think that if this has happened here, that it couldn't have happened somewhere else a long way before. And then they have then, we might be an experiment on someone's desk in their, like in, in their, <coughs> world so it's not a crit so the main thing is like we i can imagine us seeding life on other planets so i can easily imagine something else seeding life on this planet and there maybe there's conditions somewhere else or conditions which we don't know of here where it was very very different and there was a lot more because even if you have something which came like even if that just moves the goals the goalpost to another time or another planet but i don't yeah it sounds like we've had like six beers and then shooting the breeze, but um <laughs> well no, it's... I mean hey well no the, 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 to me the point I mean heck let's get real. I mean Dawkins brought up the uh the the panspermia premise himself. I mean like it's not like it's been a something that other folks haven't thought about in relation no, to No, I'm not saying they haven't. I mean just that, that I mean, you can imagine that you can't imagine like nothing. Um right. Um, well, well, exactly what I was saying, like, yeah, so in some contexts it's hey kicking the can down the road, but the other side of it it's a well, at the same time, I don't really see the plausibility of it happening without something like that, even if I push it off of the planet, or if, even if I want to avoid the premise of, you know, God being the, uh, the yeah. initiator, you still, it's, for me, I think, and for you and for many others, it's very difficult to, especially as the, in my opinion, as our knowledge continues to grow, and the necessities and the underlying technological components that we're starting to realize are in play. I, yeah. I remember reading a uh, uh, Hubert Yaki's paper from the early 90s, I think. And he was talking about this in relation to abiogenesis. And he was talking about the how the fundamental principles of information and communication theory um, were must be in place since about the initial stage. And that it was something that must be accounted for in everything that we're all the research going into abiogenesis of like, because if we don't account for this, it was the point he was making. Then we're just jumping the, you know, we're just jumping seventeen layers past where we needed the starting point, and being, oh well, assuming all this happened, then my theory is going to apply um, from this point on. And obviously, I don't know if you don't remember Yaki, but he I mean, he was a staunch atheist and anti-intelligent agency and stuff. But at the same time, he recognized, hey, we have to account for these things; otherwise, we're not being 
true researchers and, you know, actually following the scientific method based on the, the evidence. We just wanted to make, uh, you know, as you said, the kind of the faith-based illusions, whether it's religion or, uh, or, or materialism or, or something in between, uh, people don't want to, uh, not a lot of people I think don't want to actually address the, the fundamental necessities of their very existence, which I find very interesting that people want to avoid them. Uh, yeah, it so. might be very easy to, that there might be a, a different change, like a different condition where these things like DNA does start just spooling out. And then like, it might be that, that this happened, but the probability is hard to imagine where that is. And certainly on what I, my very little I know about um, geographic, um, ge what well, it is, time, but going right back, um, geolog geological timing. Right. And what's changed on the earth, there's not, there's not, there's some, there must be some piece missing from the puzzle. No, that's, uh, that's, that's very true. And uh, well, Dr. Go, I greatly appreciate your time. I know we uh, need to cut it off for about t two hours. So thank you so yeah. much for your time, sharing your knowledge with us. I'm really looking forward to uh, November when your next paper comes out. And I'd love to have you uh, back on again to discuss uh, these sorts of things if you're interested and in, uh, potentially be able to uh, keep, uh, taking advantage, I guess, of your knowledge and your research and all the uh, things you're discovering. Sure. And it's been, thanks for the opportunity and for the good questions. It's been a good discussion. Uh, yeah, enjoyed it. Awesome. But now it's the weekend. So I'm going to say bye. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Have a good one. And folks, thanks so much for joining us, all your support. I greatly appreciate all your super chats and everybody who's been uh, helping to make all this stuff happen. And uh, as I will be having another stream uh, later tonight, and we got another one tomorrow. Uh, so make sure you join us and ultimately uh, thanks again. And as I always love to say, as you contemplate the underlying necessities of your existence, all the things that you must account for in terms of your understanding of the world, the cosmos and all the things that just surround us uh, in society. And as you interact with your friends, make sure that the conclusions you reach are logical, plausible and probable. Have a good one, folks.